Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, last uh, night I arrived and I was taken to wow. Today you had that beautiful pofri. It's quite a homecoming. I feel quite emotional about being back and seeing the many friends that are here in the audience. But let me begin by engaging you in the stories of three people that I have had the privilege to know and work with and count as friends over many years. For the sake of confidentiality, I have changed their names. Their stories all share a similar theme of finding the right place to live. Just got to work this. Rose is a woman now in her 60s who grew up in a series of large residential settings across Victoria, Australia. At the age of 35, she was discovered by a group of social workers who suggested that she might like to consider leaving the institution to live in a five-bedroom house in suburban Melbourne. <laughs> Soon after moving in, Rose was introduced to an advocate, and within six months, she indicated that she wanted to move and live more independently. With the support of her advocate, she moved into a flat in a nearby suburb. After six months, she indicated again she would like to move closer into the city. Here she gained a taste for inner urban life and began to discuss what it would be like to buy a place of her own as she had met some owner occupiers in the block of flats that she was in. Her advocate had listened deeply, her advocate respected her dream, her advocate checked out that the money that was hers from being institutionalised for so many years in Australia and had been invested, was there still with the public trustee and a deposit was found. Some months later, Rose moved into her own place, which she has now owned outright for 10 years. Stephen's story has some similarities. He has spent the majority of his 50 years living in an institution. He advocated for himself to live more independently, but unlike Rose's story, there was no similar advocate listening. It was not until he advocated for himself by getting onto a television program and speaking about his years of frustration of not being listened to that he was able to move into a cluster setting. Like Rose, Stephen grew up in an institution, but unlike her, his freedom came 20 years too late. A third story is about Judy, who uses a communication board. For some time, she's been typing out that she would like to move from the group home into a place of her own. Her guardian believes that there is less risk, however, if she stays in a staffed house. Also, her electronic type messages are not consistent, and this has led the guardian to query if Judy is sure about wishing to move out by herself. So, what has led to the outcomes of these stories being different? The brief scenarios all tell of people wishing to lead different lives from their lived reality, particularly associated with their right to live independently. The core differentiating element between Rose's story and the other two is that Rose was deeply listened to. At the heart of Rose's story was an advocate who believed that Rose had the capacity to make decisions and to live independently. In comparison, I would suggest that for the other two people, their capacity for decision-making was not recognised. So, within the context of today's symposium, what does the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability hold for people with intellectual disabilities to ensure that their dreams, as depicted in these stories, are not trampled on? I see the UN Convention as a document of hope. It's a document that you've heard that New Zealand has taken great leadership in. New Zealand ratified the convention in 2008 and in 2011 delivered its first report to the United Nations after public consultation by the Office of Disability Issues, which is charged with monitoring its implementation. The report reads well, indicating areas where progress has been made as well as challenges. A way forward about such challenges is also laid out. And in response to progress, the Ministerial Committee on Disability Issues has laid out a disability action plan. Three areas are prioritised. Accessible New Zealand, enabling disability support, contributing as citizens. In reading these priorities, my mind is cast back to the stories that I shared with you. Do these priorities throw any light on what was missing for Stephen and Judy? I would suggest that the gaps in their lives relate to the second priority of enabling disability support, or put more cogently, gaining autonomy through gaining support in decision making. 
This directly relates to Article 12 of the UN Convention that calls for equal recognition before the law. So what does this mean for people with disabilities? And taken from the article, it means that people with disabilities need to be reaffirmed as having the right to recognition everywhere as persons below the law. Moving down to two, which you can see on the screen, recognising that people with disabilities enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis. Three, take appropriate measures to provide access for support. Four, all measures being in place that relate to safeguarding people from abuse, and five, effective measures so that people can own property, organise their own financial affairs, have equal access to bank loans, mortgages, and other forms of financial credit. The crafting of this article, however, has led to ongoing dialogue on what constitutes legal capacity within the context of the Convention. And I would like to share with you now a definition from Professor Jared Quinn, University of Galway, instrumental in getting the convention into text and is seen as an expert on Article 12. This is what he says. Legal capacity provides the legal shell through which to advance personhood in the life world. Primarily, it enables persons to sculpt their own legal universe. It's a web of mutual rights and obligations, voluntarily entered into, and down to the last phrase. Legal capacity opens up zones of personal freedom. It facilitates uncoerced interactions. Jared Quinn's definition has definitely played out in Rose's life. Being able to live independently, being a homeowner, being a neighbour, being a member of the local social football club, being there to visit when people like me come from interstate, being a voter, has been personally liberating for her and is a long way from the Christmas in purgatory of her younger years. Another person who was recognised for his writing and presentation on Article 12 is Michael Bark. He's the executive president of the Canadian Association of Community Living. And he raises the implications that substitute rather than supported decision making, as you saw for Rose with her advocate. What he's saying is that substitute decision making, such as a guardian that's in Judy's story, can lead to the diminishment their diminishment that contributes, and you can see in the quote there, to the risk of stereotyping, objectification, negative attitudes, and other forms of exclusion. So, in keeping with Bach's portrayal, several countries in response to the challenge of Article 12 have begun to review their legislation that relates to guardianship. And resonating with this exploration of change, I have a quote from Inclusion International their response to Article 12. And you can see in this quote that they're suggesting that traditional guardianship should really be replaced with a system of supported decision making which will require all legal systems to be reviewed and the setting up of a plan to introduce a new system. Now, response to this challenge can be seen in the transition to supported decision-making system in several countries, and I will cover some of those features presently. But prior to that, I would like to explore, and let me raise with you the issue of what does Article 12 mean here in New Zealand to the Triple PR Act? Now, from reading the first New Zealand report to the UN on implementing the convention here, it would seem that the Triple PR Act as drafted is considered means enough for disabled people to enjoy recognition before the law. The New Zealand report goes on to focus on the Triple PR Act as one that is least intrusive through adopting the principle of the least restrictive intervention and that the person subject to any order should be given the opportunity to express and develop their capacity as much as possible. So the question is, is the Triple PR Act enough? Certainly its emphasis on least and briefest possible intervention was at the cutting edge when it was first introduced. However, with the arrival of Article 12, it, is it enough of a paradigm shift to ensure that people are supported to have control over their lives and are living the way they choose? This is for you. You are the stakeholders of the UN Convention in New Zealand. This will be for you to decide. 
But if we look internationally at what is occurring in response to Article 12, it doesn't seem strong. Let me share with you some of the perspectives and developments surrounding the introduction of supported decision making, both in Australasia and internationally. And as a starter, the United Nations Secretariat has suggested that resources be reallocated from guardianship to supported decision making. And now I would like to put up on the slide IHC's perspective on this, taken from a submission to the Human Rights Commission. You can see there that IHC is supporting the issue of supported decision making, indicating that it warrants a new and specific focus in the plan of action, which I expect is the ministerial plan of action. New Zealand's obligations under this article create positive opportunities for disabled people and their advocates to consider new models. And in putting forward this position, IHC has drawn upon its years of experience and suggested that there are two necessary elements. One is the ability to have a support person of the person's choice who can play whatever role the person needs, as well as giving communication assistance. Now I would just like to talk to some examples of uh, what is being used under this term, supported decision making. The first one is mentioned in the paper by IHC and it's social interpretation, where a trusted family member, a friend, works alongside a person to support the person to get accessible information about the decision that they want and to give them confidence to make that decision. Circles of support and peer mentoring, we know about those, but in an article coming out of Canberra, um, these are being supported by advocacy organisations there, and they are calling on the government to actually fund their future development. And in South Australia, there is this concept of single supported decision-making arrangement, which is being trialled, where a person would be introduced to somebody to support them to make a decision. It's not legally binding, however, it's evaluated through uh, an external agency. That's what's happening in South Australia at the moment. There's also more formal types of decision making. Uh, representative agreements in British Columbia, so these are formal, they're legally binding, where um, a person is introduced to another to support them in making a decision, and it's based on trust. It's not based on capacity. Uh, also in Canada, co-decision making is another term that you read about when you try and explore what are some of the uh, things that are happening in that part of the world. And in the United Kingdom, the Mental Capacity Act is built on the social model, and it lays the foundation for a supported decision uh, making model and in the UK some of the decisions are sp decided specifically, uh, sorry, the capacity is sometimes assessed in the UK around the level of support that's required for specific decisions. So the international community is in a state of transition associated with supported decision making. Now the following diagram illustrates a movement from substituted decision making through to autonomous decision making. And Inclusion International has also called for training in the art of supported decision making. And you will read that what's being called for is a system of supported uh, decision making. Now, I want to suggest that we can start with systems, but unless they are underpinned by what I would suggest is unconditional positive regard, Stories like that of Judy's will abound. What do you think I mean by unconditional positive regard? You can see it there on the slide. This is where the supporter is immersed in developing a relationship based on shared humanity demonstrated through showing the person respect, non-judgment, acceptance, valuing, prizing, caring, nurturing, compassion, warmth and, of course, empathy. So, to date, I have outlined for you a range of supported decision-making options. But it's, ad it's ad here that I just would like to say that what supported decision-making is about is partnership. And you're very well positioned here in New Zealand because of the treaty to understand what partnership means. 
And I also recently read the report from a group of advocacy organisations here that did some research interviewing people with disabilities. And in their report, and Martin Sullivan is here, I, I read Martin reported and commented on this concept that, as we know, the history of New Zealand, there was colonisation. But he makes the point that people with disability have been colonised. And of course, in the early days, we referred to places where people lived who were intellectually disabled as colonies. So some of those examples that I put up, they are being driven by partnership. And I believe that New Zealand can give the lead in that area. So, but there's a further message that I would like to leave with you. Supported decision-making strategies and tools without attitude change will fall short of emancipating people from the decisions of the past. If supported decision-making is to be the ride to freedom that Quinn alludes to, then understanding its principles is as more important than understanding its strategies. The challenge, therefore, is not so much whether the Triple PR Act needs revising, or whether statutory is better than non-statutory approaches, or whether there is a place for substituted decision making. More the challenge is, are we up to believing, and you can see those principles on the screen, are we up to believing that everybody's got a right to make decisions about the things that affect them? Coming around clockwise, capacity to ma make decisions must be assumed. Every effort must be made to support people to make their own decisions, capacities decisions specific. People have the right to learn from experiences. People have the right to change their minds. And people have the right to make decisions that others do not agree with. So in bringing my presentation to conclusion, let me return to the peoples whose stories opened my reflection. Their stories inspired me to illustrate the value of Article 12. And I will go further in proposing that if Article 12 is not honoured as foundational to the implementation of the Convention, then the value of all other rights, such as education and the right to live independently, will not be accorded in the spirit of full participation of the Convention. Full participation can only occur where and if people are involved in decision making. So, what does this all mean for Aotearoa New Zealand? In brief, it means an opportunity to incorporate supported decision making as a strategy, fully resourced, piloted and evaluated into the innovative approaches that are being taken as part of the Disability Action Plan, particularly as it relates to the rebuilding of Canterbury, and similarly into the Engaging Good Lives and the other health-funded strategies to do with individualised funding. Most of all, what it means is that we, the stakeholders of this convention, need to allow people to dream of the good life through being supported to make decisions that safeguard their dreams from being trampled on. And here I would like to finish with the words of W.B. Yeats. He wishes for the cloths of heaven. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths, inwrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths, of night and light and half light, I would spread the cloths under your feet, but I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. Thank you.